Welcome everybody. Thank you to the, uh, thanks for coming on this Thursday afternoon for the first Phenom Pilots webinar. Uh, as you know, light jets keeps running off the runways. It's pretty much the, uh, the only incidents we keep having in these planes and, and luckily they are not uh, fatal. They tend to be at a pretty slow speed, uh, but obviously it keeps driving up our insurance values. Uh, and Tom as an extraordinary instructor in DPE felt that uh, he should reinforce the stabilized approaches message and then remind everybody how uh, odd the phenom breaks can be at time. So I'll pass it off to you, Tom. Wonderful, thanks, Marcus. All right, so like Marcus said, we are here to learn about uh, what has always been, not just recently, but what has always been the number one reason for hull losses and aircraft accidents. Um, if you just look at a picture of an airplane off the runway uh, and you say without any knowledge of what happened, you just say that that was probably uh, either a causal factor or the factor was unstabilized approach, you will be right eight times out of 10 without any knowledge of the incident or accident. I mean, it's that, uh, it's that severe as far as the number of uh, aircraft damage, hull losses. Uh, fortunately, um, not a lot of them turn into fatalities but, or injuries. But it's just embarrassing that uh, something as simple as the discipline of flying a stabilized approach can be fixed by just some training and some practice. Um, so that's really what we're here to talk about. Um, I know a bunch of you know me, but just as an introduction, um, my name is Tom Norton. I started my life as a Pratt & Whitney aeronautical engineer, and uh, I got tired of sitting behind a desk, and so I aimed high. And as they say, and I uh, joined the Air Force, and I was fortunate enough to fly an A-10 for uh, all my years, 11 years in the Air Force. Uh, and I did some instruction and check airmen on that too. Um, out of the Air Force, I did what most pilots, Air Force pilots do, and I joined the airlines. Uh, my case was Delta Airlines. Um, after I bankrupted that company, I left. Um, and went to Eclipse Aviation as their director of training, which I actually, um, I enjoyed the transition from the airlines to general aviation training, um, the likes of, of all of you, because it's uh, one of my favorite things to do is, uh, is, is to deal with the customers and to relate to my customers, which are uh, just wonderful people. Um, and then after I bankrupted Eclipse Aviation, I started my own uh, Norton Aviation, where, like I said, I, I'm training in the Phenom 100, 300, and the Eclipse 500 as an instructor and a DPE. Okay, on with the show. What we're going to do today is, uh, you know, always when you learn something, you got to learn where, you, you were, where you've been before you know where you're going. So we're going to give you a little history behind the stabilized approaches, where that came from. And then obviously we needed to define the stabilized approach and everything that goes with that. And you'll be surprised. Most pilots, uh, when I ask them what's a stabilized approach, they, they generally get it right, but uh, you'll, be, you'll be surprised. There's 10 criteria for a stabilized approach and we'll go over that. The other nice thing I like to bring up is the common destabilizing factor. So what should we watch out for when we're flying um, that may cause us to become unstabilized. Um, and it's nice to have those in the back of your mind when those things will pop up. It's a, a nice little warning to say, hey, I, I can't do that. Um, and then uh, on the, uh, the suggestion, which I think was a brilliant suggestion, we're going to go over the landing performance definitions and calculations that we do either on paper in the POH or with our My Phenom app. Thank you, Marcus. Um, and, uh, and how that uh, the limitations of that. Uh, I know some of you use the uh, APG program or iPreflight, uh, which is much better, um, but there's a lot of limitations that we got to watch out for um, when we're calculating landing distances. Um, and then the other suggestion was to go over the phenom brake system, which I think is a great suggestion because there are some pitfalls, as everybody knows, with our phenom electric brakes. And then finally, um, obviously, 
when we talk about stabilized approaches, if something's unstable, we need to go around. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about executing a go around and hopefully uh, uh, dispel any fears that you may have and, and, and just kind of give you a philosophy on how to do a, a nice smooth go around. So the history of stabilized approaches, um, it really started when the jets started entering the airways in the 50s and 60s. And basically the um, pilots that were transitioning from pistons and turboprops realized that these jets, and typically back then it was the big jet transports were slipperier than, uh, than the propellers um, that were kind of a speed uh, built-in speed brake. And they were very hard to slow down, especially in go down at the same time. So uh, it sounds a little, real similar to what most of you have transitioned into the Phenom from a piston airplane. And so now flying the, the jet, you're transitioning into the same regime that those guys were in the 50s and 60s and started having difficulty. But um, that's really the, the crux of the term stabilized approach came when we started flying jets. Um, go forward four decades into the uh, 1996 area and a organization, a wonderful organization, Flight Safety Foundation was started back in 1947 as a nonprofit international organization that is dedicated to the research and the education as it applies to aviation safety. Um, and after basically what you're seeing there is to almost 20 years of accidents from eight, 1980 to 1996, the Flight Safety Foundation said, you know, we, we need to take a look at this and see if we can improve safety. And what they found was the majority of the accidents were approach and landing. Um, back then, that was kind of a surprise. Today, it really isn't because we know about that. And so because of that result, they came up with an approach and landing accident reduction, which is called ALAR Task Force. And it was formed at the end of those accident period, 1996. And, and it took them two years to do this. And they published standards for stabilized approaches and once those standards came out, and by the way, those standards are still published today. They haven't been changed because um, they, they work if you follow them. Um, and they were universally adopted basically by the entire industry. And, and in fact, as technology improved in, in the airlines, um, they, they came up with a system, the airlines came up with a system called FOQA, Flight Operations Quality Assurance, and with the data link system that they use, now the airlines, not only have they adopted stabilized approach criteria in their training and their operations, but they have the data link from the airplane telling the company if every airplane on an approach is stabilized or not. And it's real time information. They think it's so important, which it is, to make sure their pilots are being held accountable for stabilized approaches that if a pilot is unstable in accordance with the 10 criteria, um, the airplane tells on them. And talking to my Delta pilot buddies, this is something that the pilot will get a phone call in the uh, terminal when he lands. I mean, it's that immediate. As soon as he lands, if he was unstable and he did not go around, he gets a phone call from the chief pilot saying, hey, you were, you were not stable, give me, a, give me a reason. And there really isn't a good reason. So the airlines have adopted stabilized approach. They've adopted the accountability of it. Um, and it's something that as pilots, we should all, um, all strive to meet and be disciplined to always fly a stabilized approach. And as you're gonna see through this presentation, it's not that hard. We're not asking a huge amount of things. Um, the accident study, uh, like I said, from 1980 to 1996, uh, after the stabilized approach criteria came in, in fact, in 1998, and it was adopted, as you can see through on the curve, we had a steady decline in accidents. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that steady decline, the overall accident was still uh, approach and landing accidents. So even though we reduced the overall accidents, the percentage of accidents was still approach and landing. Um, so and it, it's 63% uh, uh, that chart, but the number one factor of those approach and landing accidents 
the 63% of all accidents was unstabilized approach. So even though they came out with that uh, criteria and it was adopted, it really wasn't um, account or it wasn't, it was adopted, but it wasn't really being put into to practice uh, until lately. I would say the last five to 10 years is when the FOQA data is now making everybody accountable. Um, on, our, on our side, obviously we don't have that. Um, we just have to use our self-discipline and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, as you guys know, hey, we're not immune. The light jets, the phenoms, um, I, all I did was just go and search some accidents in the last five years. And I just found all of these pictures of phenoms. And, and I didn't, these are just phenoms and not, you know, Hawker jets and citations. And, and it, it's in the same, uh, they have the same issues of airplane going off the runway due to unstabilized approaches. So it's, it's a real issue um, that we can fix. It's really easy to fix with some knowledge and discipline. That's really the, the two big things. So preventing a, a stay unstable approach, just like I said, the big, the big number one is knowledge of them. Uh, the big number two is discipline. And then obviously being proficient um, in the area of recognizing state unstable approaches, and then obviously um, proficient at going around. Um, knowledge, Good news is thank you for, for being here at this webinar. Um, unfortunately, the guys here on this webinar um, are, are not usually the guys I need to talk to. The guys at this webinar are, are very conscientious pilots that want to learn always in the, in the learning mode. Um, so thank you for that. But uh, we need to get the word out to all the other pilots that don't show up these webinars. Um, but we need to be able to define a stabilized or unstable approach. And Hopefully after this pr presentation, you're gonna actually be the experts on defining that. Uh, also, we gotta be alert for the common destabilizing factors. So when all of a sudden something in the back of our neck says, ooh, that's gonna probably uh, cause me or uh, it'll an element to un be unstable. So um, we gotta watch out for those. But I would say out of the three of these, knowledge, discipline, and proficiency, discipline is the hardest. It really is the hardest. And that is watch out for the get there-itis. Um, we don't have to land here right now. If we got airborne, uh, as we all know, that it's not guaranteed we're going to get to our destination. Um, being overconfident of, no, I can I can make this happen. This is, this is no problem. Um, that's another kind of uh, destabilizing factors is, is your, yourself not you're thinking that, oh, I can just make this work. Um, because when the parameters aren't there, when those 10 parameters aren't there, we got to have the discipline to go around. And that is so hard for all of us to do that, is to make the decision to go around, even if it's a beautiful day. Um, and we have to admit that we just uh, came in unstable for whatever reason. It's a real difficult thing to do, but if in every one of these cases that we had aircraft accidents going off the runway, um, if the pilot just decided to go around it somewhere during that approach, it would have never been uh, the pictures that we just saw. Um, and proficiency, obviously, we do want to stay proficient, um, and you've heard the term practice makes perfect. I actually like perfect practice Practice makes perfect. If I send a guy out to practice approaches and every approach he does by himself is about 20 to 25 knots fast, but he does wonderful, I, I don't, that's not really practice. Um, so perfect practice makes perfect. Um, and that is, if, if you have the ability to fly with another person, I don't care if it's a pilot or a spouse, um, a family member, teach them about what I'm, what I'm teaching here, which is what is the stable and unstable criteria and have them be your guide as to, hey, uh, you're, you're unstable according to what you just told me. Um, and that helps out because somebody's, somebody's making you accountable. Um, practice a go around when you have time. I know that uh, go arounds we just don't do other than recurrent. Um, so it's a, it's a very, uh, not done maneuver during the year that you're that you're flying. Um, so when you do have it, some extra time and it's a nice day um, and maybe at an uncontrolled field or towers not busy, 
let's just do a go around. And, and you'll, you'll find that if you do those one or two or three a year, uh, the apprehension of actually doing one goes, uh, goes to zero. So definition of stabilized approach, I promised you we would define it. The, the criteria is based on two uh, elements, IMC or VMC. And, and notice how I'm not saying IFR or VFR, I'm saying IMC or VMC. So if I'm on an IFR flight plan, which we always are, and I'm going to do an IFR approach, but it's in VMC, 500 feet AGL is where I need to be stabilized. And, and where is that? On a precision approach, it's just over a mile. It's a mile and a half, a uh, mile and three quarters. That is very easy to hold myself accountable to. I need to have all this stuff together by a mile and a half final. If I'm in the weather and the, the, the uh, ceiling is, you know, 400, 500, 600 feet, feet <clears throat> excuse me, a thousand feet is just a little over three miles uh, on final. So that, that is definitely not something that uh, uh, is hard to do or just keep our discipline at doing that. So we're talking pretty close in on final to be stabilized. So what is stabilized approach? First, the aircraft is on the correct, fl correct flight path, i.e. I am on the glide path or I am near the glide path, near the localizer. If I'm a visual approach, I'm lined up with the runway. Uh, and, and we'll get into it, some more details on that uh, as we go into this list. But only small changes in heading and pitch in order to stay on the correct flight path. And we'll get into more details with that. So we're not making huge uh, bank angles. We're not making huge pitch corrections uh, to stay on that correct flight path. This is the one that everybody kind of has an idea is that we've got to keep our speed in check. Uh, the 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 criteria says VREF plus 20 and not less than VREF, obviously. Um, what I like to tell guys is, is I like to see a stabilized deceleration to VREF by the time you get over the threshold. And, and that stabilized deceleration is with power because that's the next, or then the aircraft is in the proper landing configuration. That's kind of obvious. Um, but believe it or not, there have been a lot of uh, incidents and accidents because uh, the guy had planned on a flaps full landing and he forgot and he went to flaps three. And we know flaps three is a legal landing configuration, but when he planned on a flaps full and only went to flaps three, now we have an unstabilized approach um, and, the, and the discipline comes in there. If all of a sudden you realize that I'm below 500 feet and I forgot to bring my flaps to full. And when I planned the flaps full and bugged the flaps full landing, go around. It's literally what you're supposed to do. And I know there's a lot of pilots that will just grab the flap handle, put it to full, slow down and, and go down. And, and unfortunately you can get away with that so often. And then one time you won't. Um, sink rate maximum a thousand feet per minute. If you're doing the first two, aircraft on the correct flight path and only small changes, that shouldn't be a problem. But if all of a sudden you forgot to push the approach button, and I know no one has ever forgot to push the approach button, and you're coming over the final approach fix and you missed the, capturing the glide path, um, you got some decisions to make real quick. And that is, I can either go down and chase the glide path, watch out for the thousand feet per minute, because um, some guys will go to 1,500 feet per minute to try to chase it. Um, but realize that this is all below 1,000. So if we can get it below before 1,000, uh, then, then we're, we're okay. But uh, that, that sometimes will bite you if something went wrong during the previous part of your approach. Power setting appropriate for configuration. The biggest thing I can say is idle is not an appropriate power setting. Um, so if you are trying to slow down and you're in idle, that's probably not the appropriate power setting for that configuration. So um, remember in the 100, about 60% power is a really nice stable power setting that will hold you at VREF plus 10. It will also bring you down with flaps full to that number. If it's flaps, if you're doing a flaps three landing, you gotta pull the power back a little bit. On the 300, that same sweet spot power setting is about 50%. So that's where you would expect your power to be is about halfway up to about 50 or 60% in order to maintain a stable, stable approach. Um, 
this is a no-brainer. All briefings and checklists have been performed. Um, I've seen guys where they slow down on the approach, and as they're slowing down, the speed tape now reveals that they have not put in their landing speeds. Is this a time to go heads down and put in your landing speeds on short final? No. Um, wonderful thing is we do have a green donut that will give us an idea of VREF, but um, making sure all briefings and checklists have been performed. And if all of a sudden you realize you did not do something, um, did not set up uh, something important, then uh, a go around and then we can set it up later. Precision approaches, here's where we get a little more, more specific within one dot of the glide slope and one dot of the localizer. That's really not hard to do if you're on the autopilot or you're flying flight directors. Um, visual approaches, if you elect to do one, wings level by 500 feet, and that's where your 500 feet VMC. Um, the good news is, as single pilots, we do have someone who's accountable, or at least making us accountable, so don't blow it off. On our um, enhanced JIPWIZ system, we always will get a 500 foot call. Most of us are using ForeFlight with the iPad. You'll get a 500 foot call from ForeFlight. So between the two of those entities, there's someone in your cockpit always yelling at you saying 500 feet. Don't blow that off. I, when I, every time I get that 500 feet, I always look around at airspeed, configuration. This is my last chance to say I am stable. And this is a great technique to keep yourselves accountable on stabilized approach when you hear that 500 foot call. Do not just ignore that. And then on circling approaches, uh, wings level by 300 feet. Um, obviously that's pretty low, that's a mile final. Um, and that's why, one of the reasons why I really don't like to do circling approaches because um, they lend themselves to unstabilized finals. So there they are, the 10, take a picture. Um, obviously this is all being recorded, but, uh, those are the things that are going to have to be in your bag of tricks and be disciplined to follow those 10 stabilized approach. Again, if all of those, those accidents, um, those guys could make a check mark next to every one of them, we wouldn't be seeing their airplane on a picture off the end of the runway, uh, at least 80% of them. So know it live it, be it. Um, it. It's not that hard to do this, um, especially when you're talking about VMC, a mile and a half final. Uh, IMC, thousand feet, three mile final. That's not that hard to do to make sure that we're in that, in that window of stabilized approach. All right. So destabilizing factors. What do we need to watch out for? We're doing a really good job trying to get all those 10 factors in there we're on speed, the power is up, we were in the landing configuration. Here's the things to watch out for. Excessive speed. This is one of the number one reasons why guys are unstabilized. Um, and in the Air Force, they always taught me speed is life. Well, speed is, and that's true in certain conditions, but speed is not life when you're on the ground. If I'm hitting the ground, I want the, to be in the slowest, safest speed I can. If you're traveling with somebody in a car um, and you're doing 150 miles an hour and they, they're asking you to slow down, no, 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 speed is life. No, that's not, not, speed is not life when you're coming and hitting the ground. So VREF is there for a reason. VREF is a very safe flying airspeed. Um, anything over it is going to um, be unstable. It's going to extend your landing distances. Um, and there's times when you should be above VREF, but there's most of the time a uh, smooth area, you should be at VREF, but excessive speed is probably the number one destabilizing factor for uh, unstabilized or stabilized approaches. Um, it's, it's funny to note that a lot of these incidences, and in fact, I would actually uh, say most of these incidences happen with crew professional pilots. And when you when you interview crew or when you fly with crew professional pilots, they typically came from a bigger jet down to the Phenom and they're not used to flying a 98 knot VREF uh, or any 90 something VREF. So they tend to come in at 120, they're used to 135 uh, approach speed. 
So when you tell them that your VREF is 98 knots, um, that they don't like that. And so they'll come in at 115 just to be safe. But unfortunately, that's unstabilized. And like I said, speed is not good when you're down hitting the ground. Um, secondly, excessive altitude. You've heard the terms high and fast. Here, well, here's the high part. And uh, again, the, the crew, the professional crews are used to flying a bigger jet that is typically touching down 1,500 feet down the runway. Um, and they're coming over the threshold at, at more than 50 feet. Um, and you're going to see that for every 300 feet, we're going to be one mile down. So um, stay on that three to one. Try not to get too high um, just to make that, uh, that landing well past the threshold or in a safe uh, or what you consider a safe landing uh, area. Because once it becomes down to the uh, four and 5,000 foot runways, that's when it gets a little, a little scary. Maneuvering, once again, the circling approaches, this is where um, the maneuvering part gets you unstable, or I should say is a destabilizing factor. Um, and we've all seen or heard of those uh, maneuver, the circling maneuvers at Teterboro or some airport um, where it's a beautiful clear day and they're asked to circle. And these guys, um, they, go unstable because of their maneuvering down low. Um, in my opinion, other than certain airports that require circling because of the, their environment, um, there really is a very rare reason to circle the airplane these days with the RNAV approaches to just about every runway that you can possibly imagine. So um, maneuvering down low, make sure we're wings level by 500 feet in BMC. If if you're given a visual approach, that doesn't mean you have to just abandon all instrument references. Visual approach, you can still do a, a, a coupled ILS or LPV. Um, so, because once you start maneuvering on a visual approach, those nice indicators of glide path and, uh, and localizer and, and all that stuff go away. So, it, maneuvering can be a problem. Um, so, careful on accepting a visual approach, especially if you're unfamiliar with the field, just do the, uh, you can still accept the visual approach, just back it up with an instrument approach procedure. And then this one is the one that occasionally will get people. And that is you're, you're doing the best job you can, bring it in, you're, you're stable, you're, you're very proficient at keeping a stabilized approach. And then ATC asks you to do something, whether it's because of traffic or not, um, ATC asks you to maybe, uh, hey, could you uh, sidestep to uh, one one right? And they ask you that at 600 feet. Um, that, that's unable, especially if I'm in the weather. Um, but if I can get over to that runway in VMC by 500 feet stable, sure. But uh, if he's asking me too late, no, I'm, he's already cleared me to land. Um, and I'd love to help you out, but uh, I don't, I don't want to make this maneuver over to the right side. Uh, and if and if he really needs me there, then I'll go around and reset up because um, you've seen or that has been a factor in some of the ones where it was a last minute change or request by ATC for him to do something um, that created his uh, unstabilized approach. But he was doing a great job right before there. So don't fly outside your comfort zone. Um, otherwise, just go around and then you can you can do what ATC wants you to do later. Oh boy. Let's see if we can get this going. So that, like I said, the disciplined uh, approach to this is the hardest element is when, when I need to make the call to go around and it might be for something very small, it's hard to admit that, ooh, I, I screwed this approach up uh, or to say unable to ATC because they want me to do something. And it's that, that uh, famous quote that we've, we've heard, and actually I, I looked it up, it came from a, a cartoon back in 1970. We have met the enemy and he is us. This applies so well in this situation because as pilots, we have personalities um, that are going against um, going around or making the decision not to continue this approach because we want to adapt to the environment. We want to accommodate 
ATC and our passengers, if we got a, a passenger that really needs to be on the ground, um, we, we want to rise to the occasion when we're given a challenge. We're very mission oriented. We, we need to get her done. All of these attributes are going against the discipline of making the decision to go around if you're unstable. And, and we just wanna make sure that we are gonna stay within the performance limits of your aircraft. Um, but th this statement is so apropos here. We have met the enemy and he is us. Um, it, it just says it all that because of our, our personalities, um, we have a hard time making that go around decision and, and it, it's happening over and over and over again, as you can see from the accidents. Um, so even the best of us doing a stabilized approach can make the mistake of planning on landing on a runway that is not within the performance of our airplane. And, and I'll show you how you can get kind of lulled into that with the limitations that we have if we're looking up landing distances in either the POH or the app. Um, so we need to really understand where all this information comes from and what exactly it means. So in the POH introduction to the landing data, they have what is called the landing technique. And as you can read, the landing performance data in the POH that they're gonna publish is based on the following conditions. In the big picture here, this is based on a test pilot doing exactly these things. And you're gonna find that exactly these things are none of which we do. Um, steady three degree angle at approach at VREF in landing configuration. So we, we do pretty, pretty good at that, but most of us don't do it at VREF. We're always just VREF plus three or VREF plus five. We don't like to be right on VREF. Um, so, is that unsafe? No, as long as we account for that, um, you know, being a little bit hot, uh, fast on VREF is definitely not unsafe. Um, and it's what we do. But realize that the numbers that we're going to get from the manual are based on VREF, not VREF plus five. So that's one thing we've got to, to put in there. VREF airspeed maintain at runway threshold. Uh, again, not VREF plus five. Uh, idle thrust established at the runway threshold. In other words, at 50 feet, um, we are going, which is we're coming over on a three degree glide path. We're at 50 feet over the runway threshold. We go to idle. Some of you may have been flying another airplane that if you did that, um, like turboprops come into mind. If you did that, the blades go flat. We get a big speed break. And from 50 feet, if we go to idle, we're going to bang into that runway. So from a different airplane, you might have the technique of not reducing to idle right at 50 feet. You might do it kind of in the flare. Uh, I've seen that a lot. In fact, I had to do that when we were flying the airlines. If you ever went to idle at 50 feet in the airlines, you, you got a huge uh, bad landing. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a technique that you've got to use in the phenoms um, because that's the, what we want to repeat when we get the landing distances. Attitude maintained until main landing gear touchdown. I will tell you, I don't think I've ever seen a pilot do that. Uh, even if you tried, you still couldn't do it, which means that as you're coming down final on the ILS or the LPV, you do not move your pitch at all when you go to idle at 50 feet. And I've never seen a pilot do that. They always wanna do a little round out just a little flare, just to get that sweet touchdown. But realize that when you do that, you're extending your distance uh, and not in accordance with the numbers that you're getting out of the POH. Here's another one, maximum break applied immediately after main landing gear touchdown. Holy cow, I've never seen anybody do that. So what they're saying is, as soon as the main gears touch down and the nose wheel is still in the air, go to maximum braking. I mean, number one, we rarely ever do maximum braking. Number two, we never touch the brakes when the nose wheel's still in the air. But this is what these numbers are based on. So we've got to account for the real human uh, factors here where we're not going to go maximum braking at main landing gear touchdown. We're going to wait for the nose wheel to come down and then we're going to start braking. 
whether it's maximum or not is really up to you. Um, the, the last one's pretty obvious. Anti-skid's got to be oper operative, and that's usually the case in, in all our landings. Um, but there's a lot of stuff there that we talked about that the POH is deriving these numbers for that we never do. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to maintain my attitude all the way to main landing gear touchdown. I'm not doing maximum braking when I get main landing gear touchdown. I'm going to wait for the nose wheel to come down, and I'm going to make sure I'm rolling down the runway uh, on the center line. So a lot of these things. And, and so what, what, uh, what you can find is there's some human factors when we need to apply what are actual POH published landing distance, or I should say, when you get the unfactored landing distance, what you need to add to that unfactored for those human factors that we just talked about. Um, Neil Singer came up with a great presentation a few years ago where he actually applied the real world pilot and what these things meant. And he did a, he did a bunch of research. He did some math, some equations, um, some geometry, and he actually came up with some really good numbers that, that really work. And he said, okay, so the, the steady three degree angle uh, approach at VREF and landing configuration well, let's say you're coming over the threshold just a little bit high. You're, you're like an airline pilot uh, and you're only 20 feet high. So you're 70 feet over the threshold. Well, for 20 feet, for every 10 feet, it's 200 foot more landing distance. So in this case, if you're 20 feet high, you're going to add 400 feet to your unfactored landing distance. Here's the one that we always will do. We're, we're just a little fast on VREF coming over the threshold. In this case, we're five knots faster. And for every knot, it's 40 feet of runway. So uh, five knots would compute to 200 feet more than the unfactored landing distance. Um, like I said, no, nobody is gonna maintain the attitude to main landing gear touchdown. We're always gonna just give it just a little bit of a flare. And I, and I said a three second flare, which is pretty reasonable instead of just banging the, the airplane on the ground. Um, and that comes to 170 feet per second, which is 100 knots. Um, so that three seconds just cost you 510 feet to do a flare, to get that sweet touchdown. And I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying realize when you do that, you need to account for that in your landing distance. Um, and then because we're not going to go maximum breaking at main landing or touchdown, we're going to wait for the nose wheel to come down. Uh, and stay directional control. And that's just going to cost us two seconds. That's pretty quick. One, two. That's, that's uh, I mean, a lot of times it might even cost you more, three or four. But a two second delay in braking, once again, 170 feet per second is another 340 feet. And when you add all this up, the landing, when you put in the human factors of real world landing, comes to 1,450 feet more than the published POH landing distance. Um, and if you're landing on a 4,040 some foot strip and you come out with some landing distances in the 3,000, now you're playing with, even if you did everything right, a stabilized approach, um, but you put the human factors into it, um, you're really coming close to the edge of that runway. And again, realize that the un, or the, um, uh, the POH unfactored landing distances are based on maximum braking, and maximum braking is something that we rarely ever do. So I kept saying unfactored, the POH unfactored landing distance. What is the, but they also publish this factored landing distance. What's the difference between unfactored versus the factored? And it's really, really simple. It is essentially math. So we have unfactored distances, dry and wet. We have factored distances, dry and wet. And essentially, the, the unfactored is what we just talked about. It's the flight test pilot that did all of those criterias um, and demonstrated that, and in this case, that dry runway if you're at VREF and you slam it on the runway, don't flare, maximum braking with main gear is going to do 2,000 feet. The rest is just math. 
multiply that number by 1.67 or 67% higher, you get your factored distance. You multiply it by 31%, you get your wet distance and so on and so on. It's just math to get the factor distances and the wet distances. And what does that tell you? That, that's, that's assuming that, well, a 31% unfactored wet, uh, you multiply it by 1.31 to get 2615. Is that, is that accurate? Well, does that account for concrete versus asphalt, um, grooved versus ungrooved? a fair condition runway versus an excellent condition runway? Obviously not. So realize that even these distances, unfactored versus factored, is just a math equation, and it's not bringing in all the elements of the runway conditions, the runway, um, uh, if it's fair, poor, or asphalt, or concrete, grooved or ungrooved. So that also goes into your bag of tricks when you're, when you're looking at stuff like that. So for us, we look at usually dry, um, unfactored versus factored, 0.67. If you notice the difference between those two numbers is 1340. That's kind of near our 1450. So the factor distance really actually came from the FAA. The FAA came out with a regulation for part 135 operators, it's 135.385. And they say basically that you can't land an airplane unless the uh, runway is at least 67% or 1.67 times your unfactored distance. So when you operate the phenoms in a 135, they, the FAA won't allow you to land at a runway that is within your, your unfactored distance. They want to make sure you put 67% on top of it, and they call it factored. So what a great idea. And, and that 67% is really accounting for the human factors. And so that's something that we should probably use as part 91 operators. So when you look up your landing distances and that unfactored is always what the app is gonna tell you, we need to, to, to calculate the, the factored to really be safe on our operations. And I was talking to Marcus yesterday um, and the only way to get factored numbers out of the app is to put in wet. And once you put in wet, the app will give you both unfactored and factored wet. Uh, Marcus said he's gonna plan on in the next revision of the app to once, if we put in dry, it will give us both unfactored and factored numbers. So that will be wonderful for the guys that use the app. You're gonna be able to get that factored number, which is really the number you want to go off of as to calculating what my runway analysis is going to be here for landing. So I'm not going to do something that uh, the airplane can't do when you put the human factors into the landing. <clears throat> so let's go over a sample airport to really kind of hammer this in. I picked Sedona out in Arizona. Um, one of our accidents that you saw in the pictures was a, uh, a, a professionally pro flown uh, crewed airplane landing at Sedona, went off the end of the runway. Um, it would total the airplane. And, and here's, here's how they may have been, uh, you know, it, it was, one of the factors was unstabilized approach. They were very, very fast. But, um, but here's some of the considerations that you as Part 91 operators need to look at when you're looking at a runway analysis for landing. So Sedona is 5,100 feet long, the runway. Seems pretty reasonable. Um, if you look at most of our uh, phenom accidents uh, of runway excursions, you're, you'll find that the majority of them are, are to runways less than 5,000 feet. So I always recommend, especially new type rated pilots on the 100 and the 300, that they set a minimum personal limit of 5,000 feet. Um, statistically, it's just gonna help you. So here we are at a runway, it's 5,100 feet. It's within that personal minimum. Problem is it's at 4831 elevation. So that makes it a whole new ball game. So if we go into the app or the POH, I actually did this yesterday. And this is about uh, five o'clock Eastern time yesterday. I got the METAR for Sedona. And you'll notice that uh, I put in dry numbers. 
uh, 190 degrees at eight for the wind. It was 32 degrees temperature, uh, barometer 3021. And I just put a reasonable landing weight for the Phenom 100 um, of 8,800 pounds. And that's basically burning about 2,000 pounds in route, um, lit, letting you land with about 750, 800 pounds. Um, so it's not a really, really light airplane, but it's not a heavy airplane. Um, and so I've got the dry numbers. Uh, and you obviously we're going to pick runway two one because of the wind one nine zero eight, and you get the uh, your landing speeds obviously your uh, unfactored landing distances and you'll find that ooh I can't land with flaps full. Um, anytime you see red on this app, um, you're going to have a problem with single engine climb, and in this case, flaps full. I can't do that because my single engine climb at VAC for flaps two on the missed approach. So it's all about the missed approach when you're landing. It's all about the takeoff on takeoff. But um, so I can't do a flaps full, not because of the flaps full landing, it's because of the flaps two missed approach. If I were to lose an engine, I would not make the single engine FAA climb requirement. So I'm, I have to do flaps three on this approach. And you'll find that with the speeds there, um, I have my unfactored landing distance of 3,000, and I can't see it. I think it's 67. Uh, but wait, this is this is where we we stop and go. Okay, number one, as we've discussed, this is based on the test pilot doing everything um, that we listed that we probably aren't going to do. So there's no human factors in here. But the other problem is um, the app and nor the POH numbers are corrected for slope. And if you recognize that at Sedona, runway 21 has a minus 1.83% slope, down slope. Obviously that's gonna make things worse. So we actually have to go into our POH and look for the table for the runway slope correction factor. For our case today with a one, minus 1.83, that comes out to a 1.2 um, correction factor. So if you do 1.2 times our 3,067 unfactored, we now have a new unfactored landing distance of 3680 that now takes account for the slope. So realize that the POH numbers and the app numbers are not gonna account for the slope. I, I don't know if the uh, APG, the iPreflight, um, is accounting for slope. I don't use that, um, but uh, just make sure that we know it's accounting for slope when we do have it. So if you look at that 3680, again, this is the test pilot unfactored, and we add our little human factors 1450 to it, we are now already over the 5100 foot runway. So if you do everything absolutely right, and you come in stabilized approach and you apply maximum braking two seconds after that, you know, the, the main, or I should say you wait for the nose wheel and you apply maximum braking, you are going off the end of the runway if you add just human factors to it. Um, and try to do what these guys did at Sedona with the, uh, I think it was the jet suite airplane, they were, they were not B-REF plus five, that they had more human factors. They were B-REF plus 25. Um, they did everything. I mean, they, that was one of the causal factors, but even with maximum braking, um, as you can see that, that 1,450 feet human factors um, would put them right off the runway, even if you did everything right. And that's the really scary part is when you're looking at unfactored landing distances, they can really bite you if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, so what did, what did I suggest? I suggest that we follow the 135 rule. So if and when we start seeing factored landing distances in the app, or you have the wherewithal to go look at this chart in your POH and convert your unfactored to factored, you would find that that 3860 um, number turned into a factored number of 6146. That's a thousand feet over our 5100. So on this particular day, on this particular weight, 
um, I would not recommend a Phenom 100 coming into, into uh, Sedona, um, even though our app is calculating 3680, which sounds like, oh, that shouldn't be a problem. The factor distance, which is our 67%, which accounts for all those human factors and safety margin is well beyond the 51. So um, it's not an airport that I would recommend for the Phenom 100, at least on this day. And then God forbid that a rain shower came about 30 minutes before you touched down. And now you've got to deal with the wet distance and the unfactored wet, i.e. test pilot wet is, is right at the limit, uh, right at 5,000. And the factored is well beyond it. This would not be an airport definitely for a wet runway landing. And I, I don't want to pick on the guys at Elk River, but if you want to do the math at Elk River, um, for the Phenom 300, you're going to find the same numbers. They're, they're just astronomically longer factor distances than Elk River was. And so even though those guys might have done everything right on their approach, they just shouldn't have been landing on that runway and it was wet and uh, it was just beyond the performance of the airplane. Okay, so like I said, a good suggestion is to talk about the brake system because the brakes have been a contributing factor, uh, or I should say the lack of knowledge of our brake system has been a contributing factor on some of the cases of airplanes going or phenoms going off the runway. Um, so as we look at this brake system schematic, I call this the schematic for the engineers. And uh, even though I am one, I still don't like it. <laughs> I don't really know how that works. So I come up with the, the schematic for pilots. And basically on the Phenom, uh, both 100 and 300, we've got our foot pedals that we push on with our feet. That sends a electrical signal to a computer called the brake control unit, BCU, which then modulates hydraulic pressure to our wheel brakes in such a way that it won't let the wheel skid or anti-skid uh, system. So it's a wonderful system. It works great. I mean, it just stops the airplane on a dime. The real problem, in my opinion, with the system is that this electrical foot pedal to a computer, the computer then actuates pressure to the brakes. Um, so we have no direct control over our brakes. It's just a computer doing it for us. The pro the, in my opinion, the real problem is there is no feedback from the brake system to the feet. The only feedback the pilot gets is either deceleration or more importantly, lack of deceleration. So here's the scenario that many phenoms have gotten themselves into and many pilots have done the wrong thing because of their lack of knowledge of the brake system. And that is, I call it the phenom dreaded brake scenario. That is, you're coming in to a, usually a wet runway or contaminated. This typically doesn't happen on dry because dry, like I said, the brakes are wonderful and they work great. Um, so it's usually a wet runway. And when you talk about a wet runway, it can just be damp asphalt and that's considered wet. It could be, you know, they say that a wet concrete grooved runway is considered dry, um, but there's all kinds of, of, of gradients of wet and if it's asphalt or if it's concrete, if it's got um, some uh, what they call reverted rubber where you land, that's going to cause some, some slippery uh, surface. So wet runway is a very uh, tenuous little term um, because it just means so many different things for so many different runways. Um, but like I said, most of these uh, incidents where the, the brakes didn't work for the guys or they did something wrong because they didn't understand the system happened on wet runways. They come in a little fast, maybe 10 knots fast, maybe 15, um, and even five knots fast could be could exhibit this dreaded brake scenario. Um, they initiate brake shortly after touchdown, which we all do. And when they initiate that brake shortly after touchdown, this is where all of a sudden the pilot feels no deceleration and he's getting no feedback from the brake system that it's working. He can look down and see no cast messages, so you assume it's working, but it's a very troubling feeling when you press your feet on those pedals 
and you feel no deceleration. I'm hoping somebody is in this audience that has experienced this because it is very uh, uh, disheartening. But what's actually happening is the airplane is decelerating. They sit, you just don't feel it. Um, and what's actually happening is that computer has determined that it cannot apply brakes because above the hydroplane speed, which is for us around 80, 70 to 80 knots, it cannot apply any brakes. So when you push your feet on the pedal and send the signal to the computer, the computer says, uh-uh. And we don't get any, what well, we don't feel any deceleration. And in our feet, we don't feel that the anti-skid is working. A lot of cars and other airplanes they send a feedback of clicking or pressure back to the pedal to kind of give the pilot saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but I, I can't do it right now. Well, we don't get any of that. So we just have to trust the system and, and hope that it all works. And it will. If you've done the right math of calculating those landing distances and you've accounted for the human factor, i.e. hopefully you've used the factored landing distance, the airplane will work, and the system you're you're gonna you're gonna make it. It's gonna make it happen uh, as long as we don't have any cast messages. So the answer is, what do we do when we get into this dreaded brake scenario and we we push on the pedals and we don't feel any deceleration? There's only one thing to do, and that is stay on the brakes. Now, if you suspect a brake failure, we do have the option of going around. Even though we're on the runway, we can go around. But um, most of the time. We've, we've gotten out of those uh, infant mentality brake failures that we had early on in the 100. That you, we're not seeing brake failures as much, um, but stay on the brakes. So the guys that got in trouble that didn't understand this, they would come off the brakes and then go back on as if something was wrong. And when they do that, they're just eating up more runway and the, the brake system is not able to actually do its job. Um, other guys have just assumed I have a brake failure, even though they don't have a cast message, and they reach for the brake hand, the emergency brake handle. And as we all know, once you do that, you're you're disregarding anti skid, no anti skid on the emergency brake, and typically that's locked up tires, blown tires, and off the runway they go. So it's a it's a scary situation when you put on brakes and you don't feel a deceleration. But as long as you don't have any cast messages, the brakes are working. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do, which is not break until we get down to a, to a ground speed that the, we can have some effective braking. And the guys that have run into this and did stay on the brakes, they all tell me that, yep, they're very nervous, but it all worked out perfectly. And, and, the, and the real deceleration will happen when you're below 70 knots. That's when everything starts happening for you. You just have to wait, and it's going to cost you probably a thousand to fifteen hundred feet to to wait that deceleration, but it'll work. It will work. Okay, on with the go around. As promised, here's my philosophy for making a nice, smooth go around. And I will tell you that the number one reason why most pilots will get flustered or make mistakes on go around or be uncomfortable in a go around is because they're rushing. They're rushing, they're rushing, they're rushing. They think everything has to happen. Remember a three to one glide path. If I am at a 300 foot altitude of decision altitude and I start my go around from 300 feet, I'm literally a mile final, it's a mile. I've got a mile to that threshold to execute a go around. And then the runway is a probably at least another mile. So I've got two miles before I actually have to do anything as far as navigate. So I've got a plenty of time to execute this go around. So my philosophy is just like we learned back in private pilot days, let's prioritize our tasks, aviate, navigate, communicate. And if we prioritize the task and take our time, everything will work out. The real problem is, Usually during the go around at some point, tower wants to talk to you um, and they'll interrupt this whole priority. And I always just say, stand by, but um, aviate's the number one. And aviate, pretty much everybody gets this one, toga, power, and pitch. Push the, push the toga button, bring the power up to take off and pitch. At this point, 
you're on your way. I could do the entire mist approach with my gear down and my flaps down and I can navigate and no one would be the wiser except me. So there's no hurry to deconfigure the airplane. Just toga power pitch has to be done simultaneously and now take a breath and realize that I'm a different phase of flight. I just went from the approach, concentrating on stabilized approach to now I'm on a whole new environment. So take a breath and just take it slow. And as we take it slow, we're just gonna raise the flaps by two clicks, bring the gear up and bring the flaps up. That to me is aviate. I've got a clean airplane climbing at hopefully continuous power and, uh, and away we go. Now it's navigate. So there's no hurry to get up on that autopilot control panel while I'm cleaning up the airplane. And navigate's even simpler, just two buttons. Push nav and that'll put you on the published because when you push toga, it already advanced the uh, FMS to the missed approach procedure. So nav is pushed and then flight level change. I like that rather than vertical speed. And then set your speed at whatever you like. The 100, I typically like about 170 and the 300, it's usually around 200. And then the last priority, like I said, this is the one that gets everybody flustered because tower might want to call you and give you new missed approach instructions. But remember you're, Cleared the approach, which means you're cleared the missed approach procedure. Even though your last clearance was clear to land, you're cleared the missed approach procedure if you have to go missed approach and you don't need to tell tower that at all. But they might tell you something else. And I just say, stand by, I'll get to you on three, on third priority. <laughs> so again, if you just go slow on your missed approach and just take a breath, clean up the airplane, navigate, uh, which is just two buttons. And then last, communicate. Your, your missed approaches will just go uh, beautifully, smoothly, and uh, don't bother with the instructor sitting over there saying, hurry up, hurry up. Nope, take it slow. Um, and like I said, practice them. Practice them in clear air, practice them in uncontrolled fields, practice them when you got time, um, and just practice how slow you can do it. It's a, it's a uh, very easy maneuver when you break it down to aviate, navigate, and communicate. So with that go around, um, here's my comic relief for today's webinar. And that is the movie go around and the song. Well, there I was that one fine Sunday afternoon, just me and my airplane and a little airport we'd never been to before. We were on short final and nothing was looking right. I was seeing red over red and white over white. I couldn't seem to remember how that saying went anyway, but I was staring straight down at the runway, and all I could think of was I was setting myself up to ungraciously dismantle this perfectly good little airplane, and, and then off in the distance, I heard a voice, and I think it was that of my flight instructor saying, you can always go around. You can always go around. Hey, it's 
Action Power, Aaron Claps. Hey, go around! You can always go around. If it don't look right, come down. Don't wait until your side is big and sliding upside down. You can always. You can always go around. If it don't look right, come down. Don't wait until your side is big and sliding on the ground. You can always go around. I hope everybody got to hear that. And at that, I'll open it up for questions. The, uh, you can just individually unmute, because I don't think I have everybody muted. And I see there's some chat stuff here. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm uh, Martin Gobelik, uh, Four Flights Runway Analysis takes into account the slope. Thank you for that. And I forgot to mention, because it is so new, that Four Flight has a runway analysis for takeoff and landing, much like APG with the engineering analysis for um, uh, terrain and obstacles. I, I haven't played with it yet, but I understand it's actually a fairly good thing. And it's $600 a year, as I know. Um, and you have to sign up for it, not on the app, but on the web portal. Uh, there you go. And uh, it looks like Barry Lerman's got it. Uh, but it looks like it's going to be something that is going to be well well received um, for all the Phenom guys. Questions? Uh, question, Tom, Brad Tonkin. Yep. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, so when I first uh, transitioned from a Meridian to the 100 and I went to uh, uh, CAE, uh, I was taught when I, uh, because they were having issues with brakes at that time, it was in uh, 2013, mm -hmm. uh, with the Phenom 100, I was taught uh, to, as soon as the mains touch, to shove the yoke forward to put the nose on the ground immediately. And I was also taught to land with my feet on the brakes. And this was from CAE. And then a few years later, when I uh, trained with somebody from Norton um, and I landed and shoved the yoke, he's, what are you doing? And I said, well, this is how I was taught from CAE. And he said, uh, that's very aggressive. And uh, you could blow out a, 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 a nose gear seal. So. What, yeah. what, so, you know, this is how they were teaching at that time. Um, so especially somebody that had no um, turbo fan experience. Right. And, um, so just, and, and I can't I can't speak to um, what CAE was teaching or not teaching. But uh, if you just do some some simple aerodynamic analysis uh, and I have heard several different, uh, and it, number one, I have heard this technique before. Uh, I don't agree with it. Um, but when I have heard that before from other pilots, it's usually told to me that they're pushing the yoke forward so that I get better braking. Um, and I'm not sure that is in your case, but when you push the yoke forward, it will deflect the elevator in such a way to create lift on the tail. And when you create lift on the tail, um, you are now what they call you know, wheelbarrowing. I don't think we can wheelbarrow uh, in the Phenom 100 like we can in a 172, um, but you're, you're actually unweighting the main gear by pushing the yoke forward. Does that, does that make sense how if you push the yoke forward, you're actually creating lift on the tail, which is lifting the back end of the, the airplane, unweighting the main gear and weighting the nose gear. Okay. And what that, about landing with your feet on the brakes? So landing with your feet on the brakes, the system is, is, uh, is okay to do that. In other words, there is wheel spin up uh, software that the uh, brake 
control unit will not apply brakes until they get wheel spin up. So everything should work if you land with your feet on the brakes. And essentially that's what you're doing to, um, uh, to duplicate that unfactored landing distance is you're, you're applying maximum or at least you're applying brakes, not maybe maximum brakes at main landing your touchdown. So that technique, I don't think is a, uh, a bad one as far as uh, the system and, and stopping I just, I don't tip, I don't use it only because I, I just don't want to be surprised as to what may happen at a very critical point with the nose wheel in the air. If one brake, if one brake grabs just a millisecond before the other brake and my nose wheel is still in the air and not, now I'm dealing with a different problem. So from that perspective, I don't use it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, discount someone saying that 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 is a technique that you can use. It's because it will obviously start applying brakes much sooner than what you would do if you waited for the nose gear to down. It's just, in my opinion, it's a little bit of a a more of a risk um, and it's a risk reward thing. The reward is you're going to have a shorter landing distance. The risk is you could go out of control uh, with your nose wheel in the air and braking at the same time. Also, um, depending how severe you put on the brakes, it brings the nose wheel down a little bit more aggressively than what you would have done. But if, like I said, if you're using those factored landing distances, um, you've got the time and the human factors involved there so that you can, you know, just do a nice smooth touchdown, apply brakes after directional control with the nose wheel. Um, but like I said, I, I don't, I wouldn't discount anybody for doing that, but uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do the push the yoke forward. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Got it. Thanks. Hey, Tom, it's Will Smith. How are you? Hey, Will. Good. Um, one of the things I get asked a lot as an instructor, and also I kind of talk to people a lot, is being situational awareness of your runway length. Now, yeah. if you get a runway length, it's going to tell you the full length of the runway. But depending on where you touch down, I usually aim because I was used to be 121 to thousand foot markers. Some yep. people touch down at 500 feet. Some people might hit the thousand. You always want to be in the first one third. Some people even because they're coming in will hide at the 1500. Well, the awareness here is, okay, if I'm touching down here, the 1500 foot marker, how much runway did I already anticipate having to break? And now how much runway do I have left? And I don't think a lot of people really factor that in. They say, okay and they think they have 5,000, not realizing where they're going to be touching down on the runway. You're, you're exactly right. And, and if you noticed in my slide, when I had the animation of the airplane touching down for the unfactored landing distance, if you just do the geometry and pass an airplane over 50 feet over the threshold and account for a little bit of a ground effect cushion, if you don't flare, and you pass over 50 feet of the threshold on a three degree, it, you're going to touch down 1,100 feet down. That's built into the unfactored landing distance is that air distance. So the unfactored landing distance accounts for about a, about 1,000 to 1,100 feet of touching down. But like you said, if, if I'm more comfortable touching down at possibly the threshold cross, I mean, the what is it called? The intersection where the your ILS hits the runway, which is typically closer to 1500 feet. Um, and that, that's going to add that, that extra 500 feet. And you're exactly right. You've got to have a situational awareness to realize that my personal technique is touching down 1500 feet down when the distances I'm getting out of the POH is touching down about 1100 feet down. So but that's something I didn't even account for in my uh, human factors brief. Good point. Yeah, I'm just trying to bring that up because a lot of people ask me about that. Yep. All right. Thanks, Tom. Hey, Tom. Uh, Jim Barron here from Columbus, Ohio. Hey, Jim. How you doing? Good. Good. Good to see you again. Hey, uh, so I used to fly for a Part 121 airline as well, and there. Their, among their, their uh, stable approach criteria was at 1,000 feet, they wanted us on speed and all the factors you talked about, but they wanted us at VREF all yep. the way down the glide slope. And, and that, go ahead. 
the question I have is, so I've not, I've not flown a turbojet until this one where we had a V approach, you know, ref plus 10. Could you go over just a little bit more about the timing of backing off from V approach to get to V ref on final? Sure. And that's a great question because a lot of people get confused when, when they're taught to fly V ref plus 10, and then they have to be at V ref over the threshold in accordance with the stabilized approach. Or, I mean, at V ref, in accordance with the unfactored okay. landing distance. And, and really the intent of VREF plus 10 is for when you're in IMC. So if you're in IMC, the intent is to add a little extra energy because IMC is always a little different than VMC. And so we're gonna fly VREF plus 10 in IMC. Once I break out, whether it's at 2000 feet or if it's at a thousand feet or 500 feet, I'm going to make that transition to V ref so that my airspeed is V ref stabilized at the threshold with the power. And how you do that, how you transition to V ref plus 10 to V ref is really up to you. But it's something that it's something that is reasonable to do if you take a 200 and 200 foot uh, decision altitude and transition the 10 knots between 200 feet and 50 feet. That's fairly reasonable. Anything okay. faster, you're gonna start selecting idle and that's not a stabilized approach. I agree, I agree. Yep. Yeah, they, they're, 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 they wanted us at ref minus zero and ref plus 10 at a thousand feet and no, nothing else. And they would, yeah. did, so. and, and, and what you've brought up is a, <clears throat> is, that's a company policy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the one thing that I've found from organization to organization is They'll, like you said, they'll use those 10 criteria, but the one criteria that talks about speed, they'll make little adjustments here and there. But the, as far as the Flight Safety Foundation, they said VREF plus 20 is a reasonable uh, number to stay within. The rumor had it that at this particular airline, they added five knots to REF for everything to give that extra cushion. So that's how they could keep us at REF and get away with it. Sure, and and if you're using yeah. those factored landing distances, no problem. It's kind of it, kind of built in there. Yep. We only had one go off a runway, but those guys were idiots, so. <laughs> 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 so we're all good. Thanks, Tom. Yep, my pleasure. You bet. Hey, Tom. Brad Stratton. Hey, Brad. Good afternoon um, or evening. So one of the things that I noticed in a few landings was, um, especially if there's a call it significant crosswind of more than 10 knots is that the you know the the wing that is you're dipping into the crosswind when you do get both mains on the on the ground that 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 wing kind of does the little shuffle I don't know it doesn't it doesn't come off the ground but you know it just feels like you're 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 at an angle and uh and then the weird sensation of trying to control rudder and hold those two brakes down evenly at the same time is like, you know, herding cats while uh, juggling or whatever. Any particular techniques? I mean, you know, I worked with Ron on that a, a couple of times, but because um, he was with me both times that happened. But one time I was about a 20 knot crosswind and it was pretty significant that that wheel coming up. Yeah, so you, you've hit upon a couple great things. Um, thank you for that question too, because when you deal with a crosswind, especially in a jet, um, that there's several techniques that guys bring with them from other airplanes, but for a crosswind in a jet, you want to maintain wings level. So there's just none of this down. You know, I'm putting the the upwind wing down into it. It's always wings level. Use the rudder to keep yourself aligned with the center line of the airplane or the uh, runway. And I transition from the crab to that crosswind control. This is all technique, but I'm just telling you what, what I've done over the 30 some years I've been flying. My technique is when I go to idle and start that round out is when I start feeding in the rudder and keeping the wings level so that I stay on the center line. Great point though is, and I'm glad you, you notice it because there's a lot of guys that I'm sitting in the cockpit with them and we land, and just like you said, the one upwing wind, the uh, the upwind wing, is significantly higher, and and the and we're kind of at an angle, but we're on the ground, and it's basically we're going at 70, 80, 90 knots, and that upwind wing 
uh, is producing more lift than the downwind wing. So naturally, the the airplane is is a little cattywampus on the runway. You got to go back to your private days. What do you do after you're on the ground in an airplane in a, in a uh, crosswind? You've got to go to full controls, full crosswind control on the yoke. So this, after you touch down, you go full crosswind controls and that will sit that upwind wing down. So you can now at least have a level airplane. And remember, I do it as soon as I get the nose wheel down and I got directional control, I'll feed that yoke in. The other challenge is in a, a in the Phenom 100 and the Phenom 300, that yoke is extremely difficult to go to full deflection with one hand. Mm. No matter if it's going right or left, it's a very difficult muscle group that you're using to do that. So that's why most guys typically don't do that. Uh, and they let the airplane just kind of be cattywampus on the runway. Your third point, which is another great point, is... And there's not much we can do about it. I can give, give you some techniques. And that is while we're rolling down the runway on a crosswind, I've got, I'm feeding rudder in to keep my nose wheel or keep my nose tracking down the runway. And then I've got a break with this one foot deep and one foot up. And the pedals aren't designed, or I should say your human body is not designed to put even pressure on the pedals when you're doing that. So typically what I do is I always land and I'm always taking off with my toes at the bottom of the rudder pedal. So I know that any movement of rudder direction is not going to apply brakes. Mm -hmm. And when it comes time to start braking, I physically move my feet and my toes up onto the brake pedals and try my best to do even braking. But sometimes even that, my best is not good enough if I've got one left pedal deeper than the right. It's just the ergonomics of those pedals that, uh, and your feet that is real difficult to apply even braking when you're in a crosswind rollout situation. But my, my technique is I don't put my feet up on the brake pedals during landing. I, on, during approach and landing, I have my toes down the bottom so I won't apply any brakes until I in my mind go, okay, time to apply brakes. I pick my feet up and put them on the pedals, put them on the brakes. I forgot, uh, Tom, does, does the, does, uh, I'm trying to remember the systems. Does the, does the Phenom have a weight on wheels prevention for locked brakes on landing? Yes. And we talked about that. The technique of somebody was, was taught to keep brakes on before landing so that when you touch down, yeah. okay. but that's fine. And the system will account for that, but it's just, in my opinion, a little bit riskier than the reward. Agreed. Agreed. Did, did you say in a crosswind that you, you keep wings level? Did I hear you say that? And you're, yes. and you're controlling the airplane with the rudder? Right. You're, I'm maintaining wings level. Obviously, my yoke is doing whatever that needs to do to move wings level. And then as I transition from a crab to crosswind controls with the rudder, um, and I'm doing that typically at 50 feet as I'm coming over the threshold, um, now you've got your crosswind controls with the, the ailerons, wherever they need to be to keep maintain wings level. And then your touchdown is going to be on both wheels. And, it, and really where that came from for me was that was drilled into me in the airlines when I flew 7.3, seven, 7.5, seven, and 7.6, when you had under, under engine or under wing engines. And if you ever landed in a crosswind with a wing down, you had the danger of, of uh, either tipping a wing tip or scraping an engine. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But by the way, I've heard that I've heard that's an issue with a Honda jet because of the low wings uh, and the. Exactly, you're exactly right. And in fact, in the Honda jet, most jets that I'm familiar with, they have, or most airplanes that I'm familiar with, when they got certified, they have a demonstrated max demonstrated crosswind, and and typically what that means is during the certification of the airplane, they went out to try to find a crosswind, and that was the most one that that's the most they ever found. It's not a limitation. It's just FAA saying, 
hey, the, the most crosswind we saw on this airplane was this, um, where in the Honda jet, it's a little different. They actually have a limitation of a 20 knot crosswind, which is that it's like our limitation of a 10 knot tailwind. They cannot land in more than 20 knots of crosswind per the AFM limitation. Hey, Tom, Martin Golovic. Thanks for hey, taking the time for this. Two, two questions for you. Um, I'll go to the, the, the first one, which was, you know, at, at CA, you know, my, my only two types is the 100 and 300. I went to CAE for both of those. There's really no discussion of the approach. And historically, when I've heard, you know, when I'm in there and I'm listening to the charter guys, Nicholas Air, whatever, I think they give themselves a window of ref plus 10. So I've always kind of taken that. Um, so my first question is, is, how, you know, I don't think Embraer even tells us how to think about that. And so I'm curious on maybe a technique there, if that's the range. And then, and then the second question was, is when I look at the Elk River accident, I always try to determine what, what do I take out of this? And, and sure enough, when you run the numbers, like you said, it's really clear, but I, you know, I've never been to Elk River, not familiar. I just pulled it up. They don't have weather reporting there. The closest airport's like 30 miles away reporting. Um, the fact, and I, I just pulled up Marcus's post on, on the on the form and, and looking at the, you know, behind, you know, in the trees, it almost looks like there's like a fog layer or something. I mean, it seems like it's a miracle these guys even saw the runway. Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out what, like, what do I take out of this? So questions there. Yeah, so the first one uh, is a good point because you're, you're diving into a, a, not a procedural thing, a technique, and that's the V approach. Uh, and, and like I said before, the philosophy of adding 10 to the V ref is for when you're an IMC, your V approach is now V ref plus 10, just to give you that extra energy in IMC, because we know things can happen bad in IMC. Once you break out, now V ref becomes your, your V approach, if you want to call it that. But um, the other thing I want to talk about, though, because when you say V approach, you're also talking about the actual bug that you can set. Um, and, and literally, this is uh, a wide variation of who actually uses VAPP in setting a bug and who doesn't. Um, and I don't, I don't discount anybody that does or doesn't. Um, I've just found that if I program in the Phenom 100 and 300, if I put in a VREF, which we're supposed to, a VAC, which we're supposed to, and a VFS, which we're supposed to, so we got three bugs. If you lay on a fourth bug called VAPP, it just garbages up your airspeed tape, and you could easily confuse VAPP with VAC if you had to do a single engine miss. So technique-wise, I don't actually bug VAPP or V approach unless it's a circle. If it's a circle, then I'll set 130, and that 130 bugs way up there, and it kind of reminds me, hey, I'm on a circling approach, stay there. Um, but as far as actually putting something in the VAPP, I, I, I'm of the camp that I don't do it, and I'll just remember to fly VREF plus 10, and I'll just do that math on my own. Um, but yeah, again, VAPP, the, the approach speed, VREF plus 10, um, I got typed both at in the 100 and 300 at CAE, and I can't remember if there was a discussion about that. But like you, I found that everybody in the system was flying V rough plus 10. I can't remember if that's what they told me, but um, that, I just it just made sense to me to do that. Um, and then your last bit, what do we take away from Elk River? Obviously, we take away... Um, who knows if they were stabilized or not? They could have been perfectly stabilized, but the, so I, I take away the runway analysis. I mean, I would love to hear cockpit recordings of these guys talking about the dangers of this runway. And obviously one of them would have been, hey, we don't have weather reporting. Do we know if it's wet or not? Because if it's wet, we shouldn't land here. And then there should have been a discussion of, okay, well, let's go take a look. And if we see it's wet, or if we see the ground around us is wet, we're going around. Um, I would love to hear if that was if that was talked about. But my takeaway from Elk River is factored versus unfactored, wet versus dry, 
knowing exactly the situation of where you're going and the and 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 the human factors of not ever using unfactored landing distances factors i don't know if we'll ever know if they even know they were stabilized and you know i just a quick look at procedures at elk river there's no approaches listed right um, so that, you know, right. unless you have a like marcus and i both have nxi in our 100 so i have you know you can add that little visual approach where it just kind of creates right kind of that and i've used that Wonderful. where an approach doesn't exist i don't think the three thousands have that in it so i'm not sure how this aircraft was outfitted either yeah no i mean and that you're like the nxi with a visual approach is a wonderful thing if you're stuck with a runway that doesn't have that information for you but um but yeah i mean the takeaway from elk river is just exactly what we just went through in the sedona scenario is you know we really need to think about when we're looking up numbers, what they mean. Thank you. Yep. All right, guys, we've been here an hour and a half. I think uh, that's a wrap. Is, uh, is Marcus still with us? Thank you, Tom. My pleasure, Mike. Yeah, Tom, that was fantastic. A lot of good interactive questions towards the end. We'll uh, set up another webinar in the near future on, on some interesting topic. Fantastic engagement from the community. Keep uh, posting in the forums or on the Facebook group. The more we uh, learn from each other, the, the better. And the plane, the platform is, is coming up on over 10 years old now. So there's a lot of tribal knowledge inside the community. Uh, but the phenom is getting really popular with people stepping up from the clip, stepping up from the SR-22. So let's uh, make sure that the newbies get all of this knowledge as well. Have a uh, fantastic evening, everybody.